Good day and welcome to the Devolt Nixdorf hosted first quarter 2020 earnings call. At this time, I would like to send the conference over to Steve Verastik. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Sergey, and welcome everyone to Devolt Nixdorf's first quarter earnings call for 2020. Joining me today are Gerard Schmid, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Jeff Rutherford, Chief Financial Officer. For the benefit of our participants, we have posted slides which accompany our discussion, and these slides are available on the Investor Relations page of DeboldMixdorf.com. Also, we will post a replay of our webcast to the IR website later this afternoon. Slide two contains a reminder that today's comments will include non-GAAP financial information, which we believe is helpful in assessing the company's performance. In the supplemental schedules of our slides, we have reconciled each non-GAAP metric to its most directly comparable GAAP metric. On slide three, we remind all participants that certain comments may be characterized as forward-looking statements and that there are a number of factors which could cause actual results to differ materially from these statements. Additional information on these factors can be found in the company's SEC filings. Participants should be mindful that our forward-looking information is current as of today, and subsequent events may render this information to be outdated. And now I'll pass the microphone to Gerard. Good morning, and thank you to everyone for joining earnings call. Due to the widespread and global implications of the COVID-19 pandemic, I will spend most of my prepared remarks discussing our response plans, the resiliency of our model, and customer validation of our value proposition. We were very pleased with our results this quarter, and Jeff will get into the details. From our perspective, we are executing in line with our strategy. We delivered stronger than expected orders, especially in Eurasia banking and retail. While revenue was in line with our pre-COVID expectations, and we continue to deliver strong year-over-year improvements in profitability. Starting on slide three, I'll describe our near-term priorities. From the earliest stages of the crisis in January, our first priority has been on protecting the health and well-being of our employees. A second priority is on our mission to deliver essential services, as designated by the U.S. government and many other governments around the world. Almost 100% of our banking revenue and around 65% of our retail revenue is generated from customers that are essential businesses. I'm extremely pleased that we've consistently delivered strong service levels, banks, grocery stores, pharmacies, and fuel and convenience locations, which facilitates critical day-to-day commerce. Thirdly, we are committed to strengthening Devault Nixdorf during this crisis. This means leveraging the operational rigor we have forged over the past two years to drive efficiencies in our business. It also means we are taking further steps to maintain adequate liquidity and ensure financial flexibility. Our response to the pandemic is guided by our company values, shown on the right side of the slide, which have been in place and have underpinned our progress over the past two years. Starting with collaboration, our employees are using technology to collaborate on an unprecedented scale to meet customer needs and address business challenges. This is taking place despite the social distancing protocols we operate under. We're acting with a great sense of urgency and decisiveness as we seek to enhance the way we do business for the betterment of customers and shareholders. And more than ever, our team is stepping up to hold one another accountable. In slide four, I'd like to add more color to our comprehensive response plans. Starting with our customers and solutions, we are delivering strong service levels, which reinforce our value proposition, even in the hardest hit areas of the world. In turn, our customers have affirmed our value and the criticality of the ATM and retail checkout channels. Two recent customer quotes on this slide, one from a European grocer and the other from a large financial institution in the US, capture the essence of our value proposition. And we continue to enhance our differentiation by bringing to market our DN series, next generation banking solutions, self-checkout solutions, 
dynamic software, and our IoT-enabled whole connect data engine. Turning to our employees, we've gone to great lengths since early January to proactively care for their health and well-being. We have equipped our service technicians with the appropriate protective gear and trained them on relevant hygiene and social distancing rules. For employees and our manufacturing facilities, we have segmented our workers, intensified our cleaning rituals, and are taking temperatures on a daily basis. And for our support functions, we have provided the proper tools, resources, and guidance for more than 10,000 employees to safely and productively work from home. I'm pleased to report that our efforts are making a difference and we are operating well in all areas of our business with no disruptions despite these circumstances. We're also looking out for the financial health of employees as well during this tumultuous time by establishing an employee crisis reserve fund, which is available for employees who need support, especially in markets with limited government programs. In recognition of the tremendous efforts of our frontline service employees during this challenging time, we have provided an extra week of pay. Additionally, our company has increased the frequency and depth of its internal communications. And in return, we're seeing strong employee engagement and resourcefulness during this crisis. In addition, I'm pleased to see Devolt Nixdorf actively supporting our communities. In Ohio, we've been producing face shields and shipping them to medical facilities in need. In Germany, we started manufacturing ventilator carriages. Our manufacturing facilities are all online and performing well. With respect to our global supply chains, members of our response team have been vigorously engaged since January to avoid major disruptions by maintaining frequent contact with our key suppliers, monitoring safety stocks, and developing contingency plans. While COVID-19 is likely to remain as a watch item for supply chains over the coming quarters, we are currently pleased with our ability to limit the impact. Our comprehensive response is leveraging the operating rigor, which we've created during the past two years. We continue to efficiently manage inventory, receivables and payables, as well as indirect spend. And we're keenly focused on maintaining adequate liquidity and financial flexibility. Out of an abundance of caution, we drew the remaining amount on our revolving credit facility in March. On slide five, we provided a framework for thinking about the impact of COVID-19 on default next off over the medium term. Firstly, our business model is resilient, underpinned by many customers reaffirming that the ATM and self-checkout channels are vital to their business and that our company plays a critical role in their ability to serve the needs of their customers. Starting with our services business, which generated about 51% of total revenue in 2019, we expect a mild impact as the vast majority of our services revenues are recurring and comes from sticky contracts for maintaining critical ATMs and retail devices. In the near term, we're likely to see a slowdown for installation service revenue. Certain hardware-related projects are pushed out. For our products business, which accounted for about 39% of revenue in 2019, we expect to see a moderate impact as certain customers postpone installation dates or defer new hardware purchases. In the first quarter, we experienced early signs within our European retail and Eurasia banking segments corresponds to the geographic spread of the virus. And while we did not see an acceleration of these trends in April, it is reasonable to expect that product revenue declines would be more pronounced in the second quarter. We have taken multiple steps within our manufacturing operations to create a variable cost structure to help us mitigate the impact of lower volume on our profitability. Moving to our software business, we generate recurring revenue from the sale of licenses and maintenance, which we expect will be very resilient. A project-based business or professional services could be affected by customers deferring initiatives, although we have experienced very limited impact to date. 
that the vast majority of our customers are continuing this important work. Additionally, our software teams have done a great job of supporting customers remotely. For these reasons, we expect a mild impact to our software revenue, which accounted for about 11% of total company revenue in 2019. From an industry perspective, we expect our banking business, which generated approximately 74% of the company's revenue during 2019, will show greater resiliency than our retail business due to the higher mix of services and software revenues. So while we are confident in the resilience of our business model, we've not been standing still during this time. We continue to take further decisive actions to strengthen Default Next Off. On slide six, you will see that we continue to execute on our multi-year DNR cost program and remain encouraged with our achievements, including substantial gains in profit margins during the first quarter. We are seeing good progress from our services modernization plans and our GNA cost reduction actions, especially our finance transformation efforts. And while COVID-19 pandemic has mildly influenced select work streams, we are continuing to pursue our growth savings target of $130 million for the year. Additionally, the company launched incremental actions during the quarter, which cumulatively add up to another $80 to $100 million of savings. We have suspended capital investments on internal major projects, mostly related to the upgrading of systems. During the quarter, we also reduced our annual bonus expense by a substantial amount. We have deferred merit pay increases and have implemented a hiring freeze. In several European markets, we have transitioned certain functions to shorter work weeks. We continue to reduce indirect spend, and based on our successful transition to a remote work environment, we have reassessed our global real estate footprint and are taking decisive actions to further reduce our footprint over the coming months. While some of these cost reductions will be temporary, others will generate long-term structural savings for our company. Now I'll turn the call over to Jeff to provide details on our first quarter results. Thank you, Gerard, and good morning, everyone. During my prepared remarks, my comments will focus on non-GAAP metrics unless otherwise noted. Beginning on slide seven, first quarter revenue of $911 million was in line with our pre-COVID-19 expectations and reflects the actions we are taking to drive higher quality revenue. In order to make useful comparisons to the prior year, we have provided a table to explain five different factors. Our work stream for divesting non-core businesses accounted for approximately 13 million of revenue variants versus the first quarter of 2019. Next, you can see a $17 million variance from our efforts to reduce our exposure to low margin business with most of the impact relating to our actions to call our portfolio of lower value services contracts. On the following line, you will see a $31 million variance, which includes non-recurring volume from the prior year period, partially offset, by incremental activity in the current quarter. These items were fully known and planned for as part of our 2020 operating plan. We had previously communicated our expectation for year-over-year -year revenue declines in the first half, followed by gains in the second half of the year. With respect to foreign currency, we experienced headwinds of $23 million in the quarter as the U.S. dollar strengthened primarily against the euro in Brazilian real. COVID-19 is the last factor on this table. Approximately $33 million of revenue, which we expected to recognize in the first quarter of 2020, will be recognized in future periods. This effect was predominantly in our retail and Eurasia banking segments. Transitioning to the right of this slide, you will see the combined efforts of higher quality revenue, and our DNL initiatives as non-GAAP gross profit increased $7 million 
year over year. We achieved achieved this positive result despite the effects of COVID-19 and a foreign currency headwind of approximately $7 million in the quarter. From a gross margin perspective, we are pleased to deliver a 380 basis point increase year over year to 27.9%. For $911 million of revenue, this increase translates to approximately $35 million of incremental gross profit. We are delivering significant margin increase across all three business lines, with services rising by 230 basis points, products expanding 280 basis points, and our software gross margin increased by 1,280 basis points due to an easier comp, as well as better delivery and management of our labor costs. Over to slide eight, as previously mentioned, the company is harvesting operating efficiencies from functional G&A costs as part of our DNOW transformation. We've made good progress on our finance transformation, which includes regionalizing and centralizing activities and introducing automation within our core finance functions. Through the end of March, we have streamlined our organization by approximately 470 employees. Our procurement initiative is also bearing results as we are utilizing spend analytics to reduce indirect spend. With respect to real estate expenses, we are looking closely at our needs post-COVID. We have demonstrated highly resilient ability to work remotely, and accordingly, we are aggressively moving to reduce our real estate footprint. In the past several weeks, we have decided to close greater than 50 smaller sites permanently. When compared with the prior year, we reduced our non-GAAP operating expenses by $29 million, a decline of 13%. Given this success, we expect to continue to deliver G&A efficiencies going forward. As displayed on slide nine, stronger gross margin coupled with reductions to operating expense boosted our operating profit by $36 million or 133% year over year to $63 million. The operating margin expanded by 430 basis points in the quarter to 6.9%. Our first quarter results include a reduction to our annual bonus expense of approximately $7 million, which is just one of our incremental actions we have executed to strengthen the company during the COVID-19 period. Adjusted EBITDA of $89 million improved by $24 million, or 37% over the prior year period. The company's adjusted EBITDA margin expanded by 350 basis points in the quarter to 9.8%. The next three slides provide segment-level financial information. In order to make the year-on-year comparisons more meaningful, we introduced adjusted revenue and gross profit for the first quarter of 2019, which removes the effects of foreign currency and divestitures. We are showing gross profit on these slides to more closely reflect how we are running the business. However, we will continue to disclose segment operating profit in the MD&A section of our Form 10-Q. As Gerard mentioned earlier, Eurasia Banking delivered very strong orders in the first quarter and built up a nice backlog. These ones included a new ATM-as-a-service contract with Bank 99 in Austria, valued at more than $20 million, and a branch transformation win valued at more than $13 million with a large Saudi Arabian financial institution. Moving to slide 10, first quarter revenue of $311 million was in line with our pre-COVID expectations. Approximately $13 million of the revenue decline was due to our divestiture activity, while $8 million was due to our deliberate actions taken in 2019 to reduce low margin business. Additionally, certain large hardware installations benefited 2019 revenue, which did not continue in 2020. Delays from the COVID-19 pandemic pushed approximately $14 million of revenue into future periods. Non-GAAP gross profit of $90 million in the quarter and a gross margin of 28.9% reflects the resiliency of this segment as we benefit from our DNL 
services modernization, and software excellence initiatives, as well as our intentional actions to reduce low margin business. First quarter gross profit includes a foreign currency headwind of approximately $4 million versus the prior year period. On slide 11, America's banking revenue of $345 million reflects a 3% decline primarily due to our conscious decision to exit lower margin service contracts. Within our products revenue, we are seeing good growth from U.S. regional financial institutions, although non-recurring projects at large banks in North America eased year over year as we had expected. During the quarter, we were especially pleased to generate software revenue growth of 13% in constant currency. Gross profit of $104 million for the quarter increased 30% versus the prior year due to the execution of our DNO initiatives and a favorable customer mix. We were pleased to expand gross margins from 22.7% to 30.3% with meaningful contributions from all three business lines. Key to our success was services gross margin of 32.1% for this segment reflecting very good performance from our services modernization initiative. Slide 12 contains financial highlights for our retail segment. From an order's perspective, retail performed as we expected and was in line with the prior year period. Revenue of $256 million primarily reflects lower POS installation activity in Europe, partially offset by growth in self-checkout hardware and higher software activity. Both results came in as expected. The impact of the pandemic was more acute in this segment, pushing approximately $19 million of revenue out of the quarter. Gross profit increased to $60 million, up 11% in the quarter, and gross margin improved significantly to 23.4%, due to a favorable revenue mix from services, software, and self-checkout solutions, as well as solid progress with our services modernization and software excellence program. Our cash flow update is on slide 13. As we discussed previously, the company has been consistent in our discipline in managing our networking capital over the past several quarters. Networking capital as a percentage of trailing 12-month revenue declined steadily over the last seven quarters, down to 13.3% in the first quarter of 2020, down from 19.1% a year ago, due primarily to more efficient management of inventory and accounts payable. From a cash flow perspective, networking capital drove a $15 million benefit year over year. Because of our focus, we believe the company is well prepared to manage networking capital during the current challenging economic conditions. As communicated previously, the company typically uses cash during the first half of the year, and our free cash use of $65 million in a quarter was slightly better than our expectation and slightly improved versus one year ago. First quarter results include an incremental $35 million of compensation-related cash payments tied to our strong 2019 performance. Adjusting for this item, you can clearly see that we are delivering high-quality earnings in addition to our networking capital efficiencies. Towards the bottom of the slide, we bridge our cash balances from the end of 2019 through the end of March. We used approximately $71 million to pay down debt. This includes our amortization payments as well as our contractual requirement to reduce debt with at least half of our free cash flow from the prior year. Since I have already discussed our free cash flow, the next item is cash inflow from our revolving credit facility. We drew the entire available amount from our facility in March out of an abundance of caution in light of the evolving COVID-19 pandemic and related macroeconomic implications. This action was, has almost no impact on our expected cash interest payments of approximately $170 million because, of the increment, because the incremental interest on the revolver will largely be offset by lower LIBOR rates 
for other debt instruments. An additional $89 million reduction of cash is attributed to foreign currency headwinds experienced in the quarter, plus the effect of selling our 68% stake in the German IT outsourcing business called Portavis and one other pending transaction. With a cash balance of $549 million at the end of March, we believe we have adequate liquidity to fund the seasonal cash flows of our business and our DNL transformation program. On slide 14, we highlight our debt maturities and leverage ratio. Our contractual debt maturities of $98 million for 2020 and $26 million for 2021 are manageable under our current liquidity model. We continue to monitor the debt markets relative to our strategy to address our 2022 debt maturity. At the appropriate time, we will take steps to optimize our capital structure by reducing our weighted average cost of capital, lowering interest rates, and extending maturities. To the right of the slide, we have provided our net debt to trailing 12 months adjusted EBITDA ratio for the past five quarters. As you can see, we have steadily improved this metric, and we are pleased to maintain the 4.4 times ratio in the first quarter as our adjusted EBITDA gains offset the changes to net debt. This compares favorably to our bank covenant maximum of seven times. Our net debt on March 31 was approximately $1.9 billion. Moving to slide 15, I will build upon Gerard's comments about the financial resiliency of our business model and provide a few guideposts for understanding how we expect to perform under challenging macroeconomic conditions. For your convenience, we have provided selected financial results from 2019, including revenue and gross margin for services, products, and software. We expect our services business to be resilient during this time with a mild impact to revenue. As previously disclosed, we expect to complete two divestitures in 2020, which generated about $110 million of services revenue for the company in 2019. One of these transactions closed in Q1, with the other expected to close in Q2, subject to customary closing conditions. Additionally, the software we deliver for our customers is critical to their performance, and therefore, we expect a mild impact for COVID-19 to this business line. With respect to product revenue, we we expect a moderate impact based on what we have seen thus far, as well as the company's experience from prior recession. Given the timing of the crisis, it is reasonable to expect a more significant impact of product revenue in the second quarter, as certain product installations are expected to be delayed during country lockdowns, while other hardware orders are postponed. Our current cost structure and incremental action plan provide us with the confidence to improve gross margins during this challenging time. We are targeting improvements to service margins due to our actions to improve the quality of revenue and execution of the services modernization plan. For products, we expect to deliver broadly stable gross margins due to our variable cost structure and our solid performance in the first quarter, inclusive of some level of higher freight costs. At the same time, we expect to improve our software margins versus the prior year due to better project execution and more efficient utilization of labor. Moving to operating profit, we expect to benefit from our DNL initiative and our plans for realizing approximately $130 million of savings for 2020. And while COVID-19 is having a mild influence on select DNL work streams, we have also launched incremental actions to generate 80 to $100 million of savings, as Gerard described. These actions include accelerating our finance transformation, streamlining indirect spend, significantly lower bonus expense and other labor savings, reduced travel and marketing expenditures, and savings from our real estate and information technology initiatives. Together with our networking capital efficiencies and cash management actions, 
we are targeting break-even free cash flow for 2020. By minimizing uses of cash, we will maintain adequate liquidity and covenant compliance through 2020. In summary, this leadership team has taken significant and appropriate action to strengthen the company during these challenging times. Our accomplishment, near-term plans, and company values provide us with the confidence to persevere. We are hard at work executing these plans, and we are, de- uh, we are developing additional levers to be used as needed. And now I will hand the call back to Gerard for closing comments. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah. I'd like to conclude on slide 16 with a few reminders about why we believe Debelt Mixed Off is well positioned to persevere through this crisis and emerge as a stronger company. I'll also provide a few color comments regarding April. First, we've been designated as an essential service provider to financial institutions and retailers. Our customers are counting on us to keep their businesses running. And during this crisis, the criticality of the ATM channel, point of sale, and self-checkout channels have been reaffirmed strongly. Next, our position as a trusted technology partner produces strong recurring revenue streams, which underpins a resilient business model. Furthermore, our leadership team has demonstrated resiliency and an ability to execute complex transformation initiatives over the past two years. Considering DN's operational rigor and our incremental cost actions in place, we are confident in our ability to navigate the current environment and emerge as a stronger company. Before we turn over to Q&A, let me offer a few thoughts on what we saw in April. From an order entry perspective, we are seeing a moderate slowing in hardware decisions from customers in Eurasia banking and retail, where projects are being delayed and not canceled. Within Eurasia banking, these delays tend to be mostly evident within smaller tier two banks. Within America's banking, order activity has remained largely in line with our pre-COVID expectations. Regarding installations, we have seen some hardware installations push out, typically by several weeks as customers focus on other priorities. In April, our factories shipped more volume than in the same period of 2019, reflecting the backlog as we entered Q2, even though we may see some implementations pushed out of Q2. From a services perspective, we continue to be fully engaged with customers in delivering strong service levels. And from a software perspective, we've not seen any delays in professional services projects from larger customers but the only delays observed among Tier 2 and Tier 3 customers. Overall, employee morale remains strong as we rally around our customers' needs and implement incremental actions to strengthen DBOT next off. In closing, while the current operating environment is dynamic, we remain confident in our people, our mission, and in the resiliency of our business. We stand ready to support our customers as the global economic economy recovers. Our confidence is based on the DNR foundation we've built over the last two years, the robust plans we're executing, and the tremendous response we're seeing from default mixed off employees who are living out our company values. With that, I'll now turn it back to the operator, Sergey, to support uh, our Q&A. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question at this time, please signal by pressing star 1. Please make sure the mute function on your phone is switched off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. If you wish to cancel your request, please signal by pressing star 2. Again, it is star 1 to ask a question. The first question comes from Matt Somerville of DA Davidson. Please go ahead. Uh, Thanks. A couple questions. First, uh, Gerard, can you maybe talk about how COVID-19 may be impacting the timing of the commercial availability of the DN series, and if there's any sort of difference between the regions, if you could provide color around that as well. Yeah, good morning, Matt, and thanks for the question. So I think there's there's two parts to to the question. Uh, COVID-19 is having no impact 
on our R&D or engineering capabilities to ensure that the full range of DN series is available for the market. Uh, I'd say that uh, where we are seeing some impact is uh, most notably in uh, Eurasia, unsurprising. You know, we're seeing a little bit of a slowdown of customers undertaking their certification processes, primarily due to the fact that they can't access their own customer labs as they've worked remotely. So we've not seen any change in customer appetite, more uh, somewhat of a modest delay in the execution of the certification series due to their inability to access their labs. And then with respect to the incremental 80 to 100 million of cost out actions you guys are discussing this morning, should we assume that that's a, a pretty, uh, you know, one for one sort of drop through rate down to operating profit? And then, um, you know, how much of the 80 to 100 is more structural in nature? Thank you. Yeah, Matt, uh, this is Jeff. Uh, <clears throat> A, a large uh, percentage of those savings are going to be uh, one time. You know, we talked about the, the uh, reduction in bonus. We talked about the deferral of merit increase. We have some other actions we're taking that that uh, uh, have made have been in, uh, made available to us to government programs, subsidy programs, and we also are participating in in the government. Uh, VAT and payroll and, and uh, income tax deferral programs. So all th all those things make up a, 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 ma a majority of that 80 to 100 million dollars. But there are also some permanent items in there related to acceleration of finance transformation, what we talked about relative to real estate, uh, some other areas, uh, functional cost reductions that we didn't get into any detail about. So it's 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 a mixed bag, but uh, a, a, a large portion of that is, is going to be one time. Got it. Thank you, guys. Sure. Thank you. We will now move to our next question from Paul Kotzer for J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jared. I, um, my, my question is really slightly long term, and uh, I'm sure you can anticipate this, but uh, you know, it feels like the world's changed, that uh, contactless uh, retail behavior um, may be in vogue moving forward. Are you seeing any evidence of a change in uh, behavior? Maybe there's two ways to address it. One is in terms of the mode in, with which people will be behaving in retail and, finance and uh, banking and the volume of activity moving forward. Uh, whether you, you see any change to your long-term prospects from any changes induced by COVID. Thanks. Uh, good morning, Paul, uh, and thanks for your question. So, so let me start by saying, you know, there's been a long-standing debate around, you know, the relevancy of the ATM channel, and you know, there's no doubt that COVID-19 has reaffirmed uh, in spades the strategic relevancy and criticality you know, of the ATM channel uh, as banks contemplate that their long-term needs. So, I'd say, if anything, we see that as a structural reaffirmation of the strategic relevancy of the channel. So I'll make some comments on banking, and then I'll shift towards retail. Yeah, as we think about what does that mean due to changing consumer behaviors, we're starting to see growing you know, interest from our customers for you know, more tactical you know, antimicrobial coatings on the ATMs. Uh, we're also seeing, obviously, you know, unsurprisingly, you know, heightened interest in you know, pre-staging of cash withdrawals from mobile phones. And I'd say that as banks contemplate the long-term relevancy of bank branches, we're seeing emerging interest, but it is, is still early days for banks to think about you know, more sophisticated you know, kiosks where they can use those to embed more IP rather than uh, depending on a manned bank branch. So I think those are some of the factors that are on our mind as we look at uh, banking going forward. Uh, I think that uh, from a volume perspective within banking, you know, during the steepest part of the lockdown phases, we certainly saw a, a material drop in cash withdrawals, unsurprisingly, as people stayed at home. Now, as markets have started to open up, we've seen the vast majority of those you know, volumes rebound. You know, although clearly one of the questions out there is whether there will be a slight dampening longer-term effect 
Uh, from a retail perspective, uh, there's no doubt that interest in you know, self-checkout continues to grow. You know, that was certainly a strong conversation set for us pre-COVID in Europe and post-COVID as markets are opening up, we're seeing that level of interest continue to heighten uh, as retailers shift towards more uh, unmanned checkout devices. And certainly, you know, there certainly seems to be some growing interest in, in touchless versions of self-checkout. But I would say more broadly, from a volume perspective, we're not doing our retailers anticipate uh, depressed volumes. And when I say those comments, they're primarily geared around our essential retailers like grocery stores, which make up the majority of our retail business. Uh, I think that uh, the other thing that uh, I expect to see across both retail and banking is heightened interest in managed services. Now, as banks and retailers think about their total cost structure going forward, you know, we believe that you know, we will see heightened interest in broader outsourcing opportunities. And some of the wins that Jeff talked about were evidence uh, of that growing interest. Got it. Thank you. One quick follow-up, um, perhaps for Jeff, and that is, do you see any credit exposure, any risk, and not so much in the accounts receivables, but perhaps in your backlog and pipeline? No, we're not seeing anything uh, right now, but but I can assure you, we spend a lot of time looking for it, and and uh, we're running. What we're running is, you know, one of the advantages of of where people Nick's Nick Storff and the experiences we had in in 2018 and 2019 is, we are very acutely engaged in working capital management. We run uh, some very detailed, direct cash flow models, and, and we, we are now meeting on a weekly basis with Gerard and the finance team, and we are reviewing DSOs and DPOs and DIOs in, in, uh, in, in a very detailed manner, manner, and we are very acutely aware of what's going on relative to working capital and cash flow. But to answer your specific question, we have not seen anything yet of any material nature. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. We will now move to our next question from Adrian Gorvanov of Karen Capital. Please go ahead. Hi. Thank you very much for this uh, useful presentation. I have just a couple of questions. So, first one is um, how much of the Q120 revenue was non recurring in nature? Uh, when, when you say not the, the first quarter revenue non-recurring, you mean relative to uh, uh, just a, a more short-term purchase order? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's kind of I'm trying to yeah, it would... think about. So I was I was going to say I'm trying to think about you know when you described uh, Q1 19 had a decline of 31 million due to non-recurring revenues. I was just thinking in the same way. Is there any yeah. non-recurring yeah. short-term revenues in Q120? Yeah, so so just just remember how, what our revenue and it, it lines up with the resiliency discussion Gerard had is that our our services revenue is generally longer term uh, uh, contract oriented, um, so so that is that is you know a, a longer term more resilient um, uh, revenue base and, and the same is true of software. That's why those two areas are deemed to be more resilient. Hardware tends to be based on purchase orders and, and refreshment needs of, of, uh, of either retail or banking customers, so they're non-recurring. So, so it, it's based on the individual retailer or banking customers' re refresh cycles. So what happens is if we have very large re refresh cycles like we had in the first quarter of 19 that do not recur, right, we'll get an effect like we had in in the first quarter relative to non-recurring refresh. Now, what we have is, and, and based on Matt's earlier question, we have the DN series coming out in the back half of this year, or was planned to come out in the back half of this year. So we're going to see some shift, as we talked about earlier, from, uh, from the first quarter, under normal times from the first quarter to the second half in, in large uh, re refresh cycles. Gerard, anything to add on that? 
Yeah, yeah let me just add a couple of comments. Uh, if you think back to the comments we've made in prior quarters, one of the key themes we observed in 2019 was very, very strong order activity coming out of the Americas due to Window 10 uh, upgrade activities, with uh, the first part of uh, 2019 being particularly strong with larger banks. And we've been quite clear and we've been expecting uh, a uh, slowdown in those activities as we enter 2020. So uh, when you take a look at what was unfolding in Q1 of 2020, there, there were very few big one-time events unfolding. It was just spread more uniformly over our customer base. So I don't think we'll see as much of a concentration in Q1 of 2020 versus the same period last year. Okay, that's that makes sense, yeah. And then my second question is, um, in terms of the services um, division and servicing ATMs, um, if we see maybe a slightly reduced usage, if you know if people are kind of staying at home and not really going out to ATMs or bank branches, um, do you foresee a reduced need from your customers to to have servicing? Are your contracts based on? Can you remind me if your contracts are based on number of or level of service in terms of frequency, or they're just a general servicing agreement that covers the, their footprint? Uh, the vast majority of our services contracts are related to the units being serviced, not the underlying transactional activity. Yeah, so clearly during the steep lockdown periods, we saw a, a moderation in transaction activity in some markets, but in other markets, we saw an increase in transactional activity. So yeah, our, our contracts uh, don't expose us to that variability as they're tied to units. Okay, thank you. So now take our next question from Ishtar Farooq from Sidoti and Company. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, good morning, uh, Gerard and uh, Jeff. Uh, uh, firstly, on the uh, DM Now initiatives, uh, it's, it seems like you guys are uh, stepping up your cost cutting uh, on the DM Now initiatives. Uh, is that what you are seeing uh, is like leading to the you know uh, you know step up in the gross margin? Uh, Ishfaq, good morning. Yeah, the, the primary driver of our gross margin improvement certainly has been the sustained execution of our DNR program, uh, primarily across you know, our services improvement plan, plus uh, the uh, emergence of momentum out of our software excellence program. Those are the, the two biggest drivers with, uh, within our gross margins. And then obviously, you know, the second equally important part of our DNR initiative has been the in, uh, reduction in our GNA cost base, primarily led by you know, Jeff's efforts in the finance transformation program. Got it. And uh, in terms of uh, certification, I, I'm sorry, I, I joined the cur uh, call a few minutes late. Uh, did you mention how many banks are cert certifying now? Um, there's uh, been an increase in the number of certifications uh, underway relative to our last reporting period. I don't have those numbers off the top of my head right now, but we can certainly share those at a subsequent period. Uh, but at, what I had said, uh, Ishvak, is that in some markets, especially those that went through more pronounced lockdowns, we have seen uh, a slight elongation of the certification process. Uh, banks have been unable to get to their own customer labs. Uh, there's been no degradation whatsoever in terms of customer interest in the DN series, but a slight elongation of the certification process. Got it. And, uh, and when it comes to uh, shipments of uh, banking products as well as retail products, uh, do, do you expect like most of the, the planned uh, shipments in Q2 to get pushed out to the back half of the year? Is that how you guys are viewing it internally? Uh, I don't think that we expect the majority of shipments to get pushed out. It's, you know, don't forget uh, that we, our shipments are impacted based on how the virus has been moving around the world. So you know, the Americas have felt less delays than some parts of Europe. And as certain parts of Asia open up, we're getting that positive uh, effect. So you know, this is done on a customer-by-customer customer basis. You know, we, we do expect and are seeing some push-outs into Q3 for 
uh, units that are being produced in our factories right now, which is in part why we expect uh, you know, a slightly more challenging Q2. Uh, but we don't expect all of our units to get pushed out at all, Ishvak. I think it will be spread uh, and it will be uh, unique customer by customer. Got it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We will now take our next question from Kartik Mehta from North Coast Research. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Basil for Kartik. Uh, Gerard, I just want to ask you a quick question. Just your perspective about which segment do you think is going to recover the first and which region do you think will rebound the quickest between uh, and the global market, based on your opinion? Yeah, you know, I, I certainly am no better a crystal ball gazer than anybody else. And clearly, the, the big unknown is whether there is a second wave of infections that causes a you know, subsequent lockdown of different markets. So you know, I think that, that's the big caveat that frames everything I'm about to say. But if we go back and take a look at the uh, financial crisis of 2008 uh, as one data point to, to think about, and we saw less impact on banking than we saw in retail. And we're seeing a similar pattern play out uh, this time around where retail gets a little bit harder hit uh, than banking. So, you know, when I think about that, and I mentioned that in my comments too, our banking segment has a higher proportion of services and software than retail, which is why I would expect it to, to be more resilient and potentially to, to rebound a little bit uh, faster. Um, but it's all going to be a function, quite frankly, of what happens in the next wave as different markets go through their own lockdown and reopening phases. So, you know, until you know, we all have a better handle on that, and all I could say is, uh, you know, provide those qualifying comments. Great. Thank you. And do you think this will create a chance for you guys to grow market share as other players are facing more pressure and may exit the market? You know, I can't come up comment on the actions of others. What I would say is you know, we're feeling very good about where we're at in terms of our competitive differentiation. There's no doubt that you know, our services business is standing very tall right now, and we're extremely pleased with uh, the service levels we're delivering um, that proves the uh, operational strength of our business model. Uh, we're seeing, again, from customers no degradation in their interest in our DM series machines. Uh, and, in fact, uh, recently we've picked up some more purchase orders from banks that historically uh, haven't bought hardware from us, uh, and which is a testament to their interest in the DM series. Uh, and our software business is also showing some momentum. So net-net, uh, we're feeling good about the progress we're making, and uh, I think that positions us well you know, once uh, once we're through this. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will now move to our next question from Barry Hayes from Sage Asset Management. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks very much for taking the question. Um, I had a question about just sort of reconciling uh, the free cash flow uh, guide of about break-even um, compared with the prior number of uh, 100 million or 130, and it seems like um, you're actually doing more on the cost side, um, and the margins okay. So is it fair to assume that uh, most of that difference is expecting a, a lower top line uh, compared to what you thought prior? Uh, any, anything, any color that would be great. Thanks. Yeah, you know we've uh, this is this is Jeff. Uh, we we've run we run multiple models. Uh, and 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 we run uh, bottoms up. We run analytical models. We run black swan models. We run them all right. And and then and then we look at it from a cash flow perspective and what what levers we can pull. So what what the expectation would be is there's going to be some impact to the top line uh, based upon the, the discussions we had relative uh, to to products being moderately impacted, and then the, the margin fall through from that. And then we offset that with uh, some of the actions we're taking in, in cost reductions. And then from a cash flow perspective, we're being very, very uh, uh, aggressive relative to reducing capital expenditures. We're going to only spend critical capital uh, expenditures that, that impact customer uh, contracts or customer obligations. 
And then what we're going to be doing is monitoring very closely our working capital and, and assuring as uh, from a previous question that we don't have slippage in DSOs, uh, that we maintain our DPOs, and that we, in, in particular, we don't build inventory, right? That's, that's where we, we uh, are, have a, a primary focus. So all those things in concert uh, and all the models that we run, we see, a, we see a path to at least break even. Uh, free cash flow. So that's what we're talking about here in, in, in our various modeling scenarios, uh, continuing to uh, monitor working capital, continuing to monitor capital spending, uh, to continue to pursue uh, either long-term or short-term uh, expense reductions. All those things in concert give us the confidence of, uh, of break-even free cash flow. Got it. So sounds like just to um, just one quick follow-up. It sounds like um, the break-even free cash flow uh, is an explication in most of the scenarios, and it, it could be possible to do better than that. Is that a fair read? Yeah, that's 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 right. I mean, we, we're going to pull the levers to to uh, to preserve liquidity and and to uh, expand free cash flow wherever we can. That's the focus of. And, and as I said earlier. The good thing is this management team is is completely focused on on that, and we don't have to build that muscle. That muscle exists because of where we've been for the last two years. Great. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Good luck. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move to our next question from Rob Jost from Indexco. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks. I uh, wanted to follow up actually on that last question and, and just make sure I understood uh, the free cash flow expectation. On slide nine, uh, 15, there's a footnote that it excludes uh, well, non-GAAP, right? So what I guess I'm wondering what the addbacks, what the magnitude of addbacks would be in a free cash flow to get to like a real free cash flow. Oh, no, no. That's, uh, that's a real free cash flow. What What's included in there from a non-GAAP perspective is it picks up any, any anything that's non-GAAP that we take out and we we uh, we supply the schedule showing the non-GAAP adjustments, right? right? Anything in there that's cash flow is included in that free cash flow. The only thing that's not included in there would be any uh, cash effect gain or loss from uh, divestitures, and and gotcha. and as and. Yeah. So so it does say it's non gap, but but for example, let me let me give you an example. Is is uh we, we will from finance transformation you'll see in the in the reconciliation of non gap that 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 under under the uh um restructuring accounting rules we, we recognize now for expense purposes the severance costs associated with the the headcount reductions that we're executing on, and also the costs associated with, uh, you know, the process in, uh, uh, of uh, moving some of those or those uh, uh, processes to third parties. So we incur those costs too. Those types of costs, although we we take them out as non-GAAP, we do include the cash effect in our free cash flow. So okay. so free cash that's flow is all operations. Yeah. The only thing that's not in free cash flow, and we also disclose it, is anything outside of what we define as free cash flow, but we include it in change in net debt, and that change in net debt schedule is in there. What, and as, as, as I went through in the, in the prepared remarks, what's in there is uh, currency adjustment on cash and any effect from divestitures. Okay. Super helpful. Okay. And yeah. then my, my second question right. is, is around the DN series, and I, I know – the environment is causing a bit of delay in, I guess, the uptake. C could you put some numbers around that? Help help me to understand. So, if you're if you were going into the year and your expectation was say 100% of whatever number, what are you looking at today in, in terms of that? Given some of the pushouts and, and especially with the certifications taking longer than expected. Yeah, Rob. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll frame it primarily by saying if you go back and look at our prior comments, we, we always had a view that the uh, DN series was going to be more of a back-end 
uh, H2 um, event for us as customs have worked through their certification processes. So you know, as some of those certifications uh, are delayed, you know, we may see some of those orders tip into 2021. Uh, I will tell you that um, we're not overly uncomfortable with that outcome. You know, earlier on, both Jeff and I commented that you know, there were select work streams as part of our DML initiative that are seeing modest delays, uh, and the you know, DN series happens to be one of those. So the you know, full year impact on 2020 is actually quite modest, given the staging of how these orders were, were lining up. Okay, appreciate that, thanks. Thank you. And we will now take our last question today from Matt Somerville from DEA Debit Fund. Please go ahead. Just uh, two quick follow-ups. Um, Gerard, can you maybe talk about the sustainability of the uh, improvement you saw in software margins in Q1, I think up almost 1,300 basis points year over year? And then also, I believe on your last call, you had commented that the company was budgeting some $25 million, I believe. Is it related to incremental growth investments? How you're sort of thinking about that as well. Thank you. Yeah, Matt. Um, so as relates to, to software, you know, as you're well aware, you know, uh, large licenses in any given quarter can move the mix around. So I would just you know, start with that comment. That, that being said, when you look at the timing of our various DN Now initiatives, you know, our software excellence program is one of the key ones that we expect to, to ramp throughout 2020. Uh, and we do expect it to drive increased margins in our software business, largely as we look at uh, billable utilization of our professional services resources and where and how we deploy uh, our software capabilities. Uh, so, so while I don't want to use any one quarter as a, as a data point, uh, we are fully expecting an improvement uh, in our software margins due to those factors. Uh, in terms of the uh, incremental growth initiatives, you know, as I mentioned in my you know, earlier comments, you know, we do believe that coming out of COVID-19, you know, banks in particular will have a heightened interest in managed services-related activities, uh, and we continue to invest in those actions to make sure that we're well positioned for COVID-19. Um, you know, we, we have trimmed the investment level modestly, but you know, as Jeff said earlier on, we continue to you know, focus uh, on protecting the customer-oriented growth initiatives, and where we have trimmed our capital investments, it's been primarily on internal systems. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. I would now I would like to turn the call back to Steve Verostik for any additional comments and remarks. Good. I just want to thank everybody for participating in today's call. And if you have follow-up questions, I encourage you to contact uh, me at Investor Relations. Thanks, everybody, and have a terrific day. Thank you. That will conclude today's conference call. Thank you for your participation, ladies and gentlemen. You may now disconnect.